Uh, hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming to this session on student-led learning, how and why. Um, there's three, three of us uh, today going to be running this session. Um, I'm going to quickly go through what the plan is for the session and then hand over to Beth and then Hisa. Um, so the plan for today, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction and talk about the Systemic Justice Project, uh, which I work in here at Harvard Law School. Um, and then Beth is going to talk a little bit about a couple of courses uh, that she runs called Innovators Practice and De Design Survivor. Um, and then uh, Kisa Kuriyama is going to uh, run a multimedia assignment, which is why you're all sitting uh, in tables uh, in teams around laptops. And we're going to have a, just a very quick time for discussion as well. Um, so that's, that's the plan for today. Um, so I want to start out by setting up a, a very simplistic uh, student-led learning matrix to try and help define what student-led learning is a little bit. Um, so you can think of um, one spectrum going from passive learning to active learning, and one spectrum going from a low level of student agency to a high level of student agency. Um, and by student agency, I mean something like student uh, choice and over what the topics are that are being covered and what the topics are that they're working on. Um, so I'm going to put a few different, uh, different courses into this. Since we're in the law school and I work in the law school, I'm going to start with the Socratic method, the traditional method of teaching law, where the uh, one professor stands in the front of the classroom working through the casebook, but instead of lecturing, is asking students questions about the cases. Uh, what are the facts of this case? What's the holding of this case? And, and so on. Um, so that, there's very little student agency. The students get no agency over what they're studying or how they do it. It's just an exam at the end of the semester. Um, but it's somewhat active in that the students are engaging in the, uh, in the classes every day. It's not just listening to a lecturer. So that belongs in the top left box. Um, I co-run a course called the Justice Lab, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, but is at the, uh, the top right of the spectrum um, in that it's very active learning style. There's no lecturing going on, and it's very high level of student agency. They get to pick exactly what they're working on, and we'll discuss that a little more later. Um, you can think of a traditional lecture course being in the bottom left uh, quadrant in that the students don't get to choose what they're being lectured about and it's uh, very passive, they're not engaging in what they're doing. Um, and there's not much that falls in the bottom right lecture. I call it selector lecture here where you could imagine a course where students get to pick what the topic of the day is and then the lecturer gives a lecture on that topic and it's very passive. Um, I think there are some um, homeschooling uh, books that work a little bit like that but, but it's not that common a, common a thing. Um, so that's a little matrix that I'm going to use a little bit as we run through today. Um, and so I want to talk about what some goals and challenges might be of student-led learning, and the goals and the challenges are often the same thing. Um, so uh, picking topics that the students care about that they want to work on, that's a, that can be a goal of student-led learning and can also be challenging, and we'll discuss some ways of doing that in a little bit. Um, uh, engaging with students' values could be a goal of uh, student-led learning. Um, what they are bringing to the classroom, what they came to uh, college or graduate school or whatever it is to, to work about and what they care about. Um, building team, working in teams could be a, could be a goal and is also there are many challenges to working in teams. Um, uh, fostering student engagement can be a goal and that can also be a challenge, especially when there's uh, uh, working in teams, it's hard to tell sometimes if there's one student being carried by other students and so on. Um, producing something public facing as opposed to a paper can be a challenge, so uh, say an essay that only would be seen by the professor versus something that, um, as we'll discuss a bit later, a presentation at a conference or, um, or something that's published. Um, inclusivity, um, ensuring that different types of uh, students thrive. There are some students who will thrive in one type of learning environment and some in another, and one of the goals might be to try and give opportunities for students who thrive in different ways to thrive. Um, and giving feedback can be uh, a goal and a challenge. You're giving more detailed student feedback than you would perhaps get in a regular course, um, and there are many challenges that come with that. So I'm going to try and discuss these goals and challenges. Oh, grading as well can be a challenge, especially if students are working in teams and it's, it's different types of topics. Um, so I want to keep these in mind as we go through a few different uh, courses and parts of courses that I've been involved in. Um, the first one I want to mention is Frontier Torts. Uh, this is uh, a regular 1L first year of law school class um, uh, that uh, <coughs> is 80 students who are randomly assigned to this course. Everyone has to take it. Um, and most of it is somewhat of a regular course, but for three weeks at the end of the semester, the students divide into teams of 27, so three different teams, 
and they produce a policy paper on a topic that they've selected and a presentation that they give in class and is, is recorded. Um, they select the topic based on, um, we call them problems, problems they want to work on. Um, and one thing that uh, is absolutely necessary for this is working with teaching fellows who, um, who uh, there's three teaching fellows who can work closely with each of the teams without which this whole, whole model won't work. So that's an example of a quite small uh, segment of a course that otherwise maybe looks more traditional. Um, I also co-teach a course called Systemic Justice. Uh, that's a lecture course, um, so in that way it goes on the a passive end of the spectrum. Um, but at the beginning of the semester, students select problems they want to work on and, and then apply the um, models of the course to those, uh, to those problems, preparing for a showcase. Um, so we have a conference which was sponsored by Hope last year, um, at which uh, students prepare items from podcasts to PowerPoint presentations, websites, uh, posters, pamphlets, models, all different types of things, some that you can think of science fair basically. Um, and they're producing those, and they're also producing policy papers that are then published in a journal. Um, and we have various mechanisms for feedback in this course. Um, what, uh, there's instructor feedback, uh, where we're meeting individually with, with each student a couple times in the semester, giving them comments on outlines and ideas and so on. Um, uh, but in a course with over 80 students, it's difficult to do much of that. Um, and so we also have peer, peer feedback mechanisms. Um, one of the mechanisms is within Canvas, uh, there's a kind of automated uh, assigning system where you can have students upload submissions into Canvas and uh, it's automatically assigned to a different student who will give comments on it. Um, and then the instructor can, you can choose whether that's anonymous or not, and the instructor can then see both the original assignment and the, and the comments and can grade on the quality of the feedback given as well as the quality of the original submission. So that's a feedback option. Um, another thing that we do slightly differently from a regular course is try and build flexibility into the syllabus so that when um, uh, topics come up uh, over the course of the semester that students are all engaged by and want to be discussing, we, could, we have some time to set aside our class or to, to discuss those. So one example of that was when we were teaching this course um, in spring of 2015, the Ferguson report came out, um, the just, uh, Department of Justice report on um, the police department in Ferguson, Missouri, and um, many, many students were engaged in these issues, were processing around these issues, and wanted to discuss them in class. It related to many of the themes of the course, which is on power and inequality and how the legal system perpetuates both. Um, and so we set aside some time to read this and, and have a discussion together. So that's a little bit of um, student agency in that. Um, so I think systemic justice belongs still in the bottom left quadrant in that it's a lecture course and that the students don't pick the topics of most of the lectures, but moves a little bit more towards the right for some of, the, for some of these reasons. Um, another course, one that I uh, mentioned just before, is called the Justice Lab. Um, that starts uh, with problem selection where all the students in the lab, before the semester starts, we give them a series of uh, surveys where they pick the problems they want to work on and narrow them down. And then in teams of approximately five students, uh, they, work on, uh, they, they work on those problems. Um, the teamwork brings a number of challenges. Um, challenges to ensuring, as I mentioned before, that all students are engaged and not coasting on the work of other students. So there's equity and inclusivity within the teams so, there's a, um, so that everyone can have their voice heard and it's not led by someone who's kind of dominating that team is a challenge. Uh, there's challenges to communication between the team and, and, and between us. Um, and uh, so those are some of the challenges of, of, of working in those teams. Um, I want to make, mention a couple of the feedback mechanisms we use. We have instructive feedback. This is easier than in a lecture course with 80 students where you can, um, in this case, there's, if there's four to six teams working, you can work individually with each team. And we also have a couple different types of peer feedback, um, including um, the, these students all present in plenary sessions at our annual conference, and there are presentations that are given um, in class beforehand, practice presentations, and there's another team of students that's assigned to, uh, to give them feedback on those presentations in addition to our feedback. Um, we also have something we call initiatives and initiative roundtables. Um, we've come up with a list of a few uh, cross-cutting initiatives that we have feel apply to basically every problem the students care about. That's uh, gender and gender identity equality, sexuality equality, um, climate change is one, uh, racial equality, and, and there's a few others. And we have students, um, we have a session, one of the sessions where students sit in um, uh, tables of those teams, so everyone who's working on uh, racial equality, for example, and discuss each paper in turn 
uh, how that paper connects to racial equality and, and how those issues are connected. And so that's a kind of a lever into think, each student thinking about each other's work and feedback on other teams' work from a particular lens that they've been thinking about for the whole semester. Um, so that's, that's a feedback mechanism. Students, as I mentioned, produce a presentation um, for a conference, write a policy paper that um, the good ones are published in a journal um, that we are launching. The first one is coming out this month or next month. Um, and um, we have a few different grading mechanisms, uh, including self-evaluation forms. So because we've been working closely with the teams, we have a pretty good sense of who's been doing what work, but we have students kind of itemize exactly which parts of the paper and presentation they worked most on, what their role was, um, who they were reaching out to in the initial listening tour that students do. Um, and uh, we don't, so haven't so far have any negative feedback about other students, but we do give them a chance to mention students who've got, gone above and beyond. Um, and there's obviously pros and cons to letting students evaluate each other, um, and there's, there's difficulties with that. Um, so we, we've gone for that half option of giving them positive uh, options to do positive but not negative feedback to each other. Um, so the Justice Lab, as I mentioned, is a very active learning style. There's no lecturing going on. It's all them working on these problems and we're supervising over the course of the semester. Um, and they have complete choice, as long as enough other people in the course want to do it, on what the problems are they're working on. Um, so we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't pick the topics. Um, and then we have something called the Legal Education Lab, which uh, is a spin-off of the Justice Lab, really. In the first semester, one of the topics the students picked uh, was legal education and inequalities within legal education. Um, both subjectively and qualitatively, there's differentials on race and gender lines and how people experience legal education and law school, how people perform um, in terms of grades, in terms of uh, post-graduate uh, career options, in terms of clerkships. There's a lot of uh, uh, differences there, and so a team of students in the Justice Lab, this was the topic they picked and they worked on, and then we continued this for a couple more semesters, um, and it's somewhat of a kind of a meta lab, because what some, many of the recommendations they were coming up with were um, involved student-led learning, and how um, legal, legal education can better uh, connect to students' values, how it can better engage students in the problems many of them came to law school to care about, and. Um, how the failure to do that is connected to injustices. Um, and I'd love to talk about that more later in the q and if anyone wants to know more. Um, so this, in a way, uh, it's still in the top right, I would say, but slightly more towards the center in that we uh, picked the subject of the lab before the semester and, and, and were somewhat uh, descriptive about what students had to work on. Um, so that's just a very uh, quick uh, framework and, and some of the courses that I've been involved in. Um, uh, I'm now going to uh, turn over to uh, Beth Eldringer to talk a little bit about two courses that uh, she runs and also to ask some questions first. Great, yeah. So what, what we're hoping is that while I'm asking a couple of questions about how Justin implements this, you'll also be thinking about some of the questions that would be most relevant for what Justin has talked about and how it might uh, be useful to, to you in the context that you're working in and we have these little post-its for you to capture some of those questions. At the at the end of um, both of us speaking, we'll have some time for a, an all-group discussion. So while we're chatting for a couple minutes up here, if, if, if there's something that's burning for you in terms of, maybe we put up the goals slide here for how in the discussion we might help you think about how you might apply this to your own classroom or uh, interests in terms of coming to this talk. So one of the questions I have for you, Justin, is so which of these goals was the hardest for you to implement in one of the examples that you gave? And and I'd love to hear sort of specifics of what you were grappling with and how you dealt with them. So I think um, uh, I think for the Justice Lab, really a lot of uh, so this is we're running it for the third time this year, and I think the teamwork has really been the, the hardest piece of it. In um, uh, we didn't have much expertise coming into this, and um, there's a wide variety in um, where sometimes it's teams kind of form and they already know each other and they pick the topic together. Sometimes it, they're all strangers to each other and just building in the mechanisms and the time so that they can spend enough time together to get to know each other and really work hard is a, um, has, has been a real challenge, especially when all the students are all doing 75 other different things in the semester and just finding times for them to meet enough to, to be successful outside the classroom um, has been a real challenge. Great. Now, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is 
If, in terms of them publishing in sort of different, you know, instead of just doing a research paper that's only for you, this public-facing idea of publishing, like how do you work with them to ensure that it's uh, that they get to a sufficient rigor of the content, but also navigate the constraints of that publishing hub? So we, um, it helps that we are starting our own journal so that we kind of have a, a different model of a paper than say a law review article would be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it requires a lot of work on the front end and back end and we haven't perfected this, but the front end includes having a quite, um, uh, a strong default option of what a paper looks like. And here are the different five different sections you're gonna have and here are the, uh, you can say so you can divide them up amongst your team um, and here's some of the themes that you're going to include. And we let people deviate from those defaults, but without setting those strong defaults, I think it can become too uh, free-flowing. And then it also involves, after the semester, um, where you know, we'll read it and give very detailed comments and feedback. And then it requires some of the students from the team to volunteer over that summer, usually, to, to go through and make all those edits and do all the um, citations and everything else like that. And that, that's an issue um, that it, re it requires them to put, out, put in time outside of the semester that we have to grapple with. That's, that's really interesting. And I've found when I've uh, grappled with this question too, it takes a lot more work of the teaching staff during the class, but also after to sort of refine it in a way that, we're, that it really is something that everybody's proud of in terms of a public facing publication. So as we're transitioning, uh, if you have any specific thoughts that you want to come up um, in the broader discussion, please capture those. We're going to be talking about a very different thing right now. So I like to start questions, uh, design questions, and I think that designing um, designing classes to engage people in, in design and, and engineering um, are design questions. So I mean, it's good too much of the word design, but I like to start them with the word desirability. And the reason I like to do that is because it provokes this question of what do we mean by desirability and for whom? And for me, in this context, it's about teaching our students for discovery of themselves. It's about helping students find what they like and understanding why they like it and enabling them to be creative with that. And it's also about helping students learn to sustain the motivation that they need to overcome obstacles to get to sufficient rigor in the classes that we're um, teaching. So there's some original research that frames the design of both of the courses that I'm talking about. And it starts with this question of why do 65 to 90 percent of innovation projects fail? The real figures are about 70 to 90 percent, 65 percent is Kickstarter um, projects and they have a little sort of friends and family boost. And researchers actually know a lot about innovation. We tend to uh, define it as a combination of producing something that is useful and also novel. Um, that's an outcome-based definition of innovation. There are also process-based definitions, but this is a, a simplified version of things. So we've studied it at the individual level. We know that we need individuals to have sufficient domain skills, creative ability, that is the ability to think differently about a problem and uh, intrinsic motivation to stay involved in the problem long enough to do something cool with it. We've studied at the, at the team level, we know that things like um, functional or skill diversity can be helpful for teams. We've studied it at the project idea level, at the organizational level. And that's a summary to just say that we, we actually know a lot about it. Um, nonetheless, the rates of failure are very high, right? That's interesting to me. and so. I did, this is um, starting in my PhD, starting to do field research inside top companies. So these are the leaders in their field. Um, companies like IDEO, J. Walter Thompson, Gucci, Puma, et cetera. So these are 350 real projects. They all have the same goal of uh, an innovative outcome. That is something that is original and practical. Um, and these projects represent the diversity of, uh, or the complexity of how innovative work is happening in a lot of global companies today. That is, the, their teams are cross-disciplinary, they're often cross-cultural, and they're often involving multiple companies collaborating together. And this goes across a variety of global locations. Uh, 
The summary is that in that data set of, of 350 or so projects, about 32% of the time they're achieving that goal of something that is truly original and uh, practical. So that matches more or less what we see in other data sets. Um, another 25% of them are producing something that is above average according to that definition. And these teams tend to experience some uh, interpersonal dysfunctioning, uh, but they tend to overcome it by uh, resolving those problems within themselves. And then these ones that tend to perform poorly um, are largely performing poorly because of interpersonal reasons, um, perception of interpersonal intent, which I'll get into in a moment, like feeling that it's an unsupportive environment because you're being belittled by someone else, um, you're being abandoned by someone else, or um, micromanaged by someone else. And um, if, if, like, putting that into a framework, you have these you have individuals coming in, and in this example, they're very talented at the global level. They navigate this process, this, um, their own process. Like, how is this going to go about? What, what sort of hierarchy are we going to have? How do we accumulate status? How do we share information? All things that are pretty familiar to us. You have external feedback that comes in, and what's important is the perception of that feedback for uh, supporting, continuing, doing something very innovative. If that is perceived as supportive, you tend to maintain high creative engagement. If it's perceived as mixed, uh, depending on individuals, you can get different uh, engagement levels. And if it's perceived as unsupportive, you tend to get low creative engagement. And what that tends to do is just handicap the project. So that means that time, cognitive energy, and uh, motivation are spent around uh, understanding why it's unsupportive and like troubleshooting team issues instead of creating a cooler project. So the way that I understand that is that innovative projects are a series of hundreds of small decisions while making shortcuts to cope with overwhelming uncertainty. And the top teams excel at structuring their decision making and staying motivated. So there are three types of motivation that I think about in designing for the classroom. We know about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and probably speak less about collaborative motivation. That's where you show up for the other people involved and because you are excited about those people. I also um, play a lot with um, thinking about behavioral change in ways that if my goal is to get my students, all of my students, to make those effective decisions in that uncertain environment, uh, I need them to have both high motivation and high ability. And there are different ways that I can play with that in the classroom, and hopefully we'll talk about that uh, in, in the discussion. And there are different ways that if they have high motivation, I can um, put nudges in the, in the path of these motivated people to get them to get more of those ability skills along the way. Um, so I want, as much as possible, on my students to be sort of in this um, middle area. But the reality is that my students are, they come in in all of these different areas. So another challenge for me is uh, how to make the classroom individualized in a way that responds to all of those different needs. So these students are high in motivation, but lower in ability. Uh, and the reverse might be true over here. My students also come in with different goals for what they want out of a design class and different output competencies. Um, meaning some students might be really good at creating original things, but those things aren't very practical. Or they might be very good at creating very practical things and those things aren't very original. But the reality of the design world is both of those are very useful skills. And so in grading their projects, I actually grade them in like multiple different ways now because I realize that, that there's something sort of false about grading them solely based on originality. Um, okay, so two different courses I've designed in different ways using a different kind of structure for decision making in the innovator's practice. I use human-centered design, which is a field-based approach to finding needs that can help you get around confirmation bias. Um, and then we do some uh, data analytical work in there. 
And then the motivational side comes from research on organizational behavior. Um, in designing for desirability, that class is often also called design survivor. We use a different approach to that. It's uh, we use frameworks, uh, a lot of which come from advertising research, and um, and then they have like a they keep a diary every week where they're they're uh, collecting examples of desirable <coughs> products and services in the world, and then we analyze that diary to see patterns of what they're finding interesting in other people's products, and we also look at the patterns in what they are designing in the class. Uh, that's not something that would be, you know, publishable research or anything. But it's just as a as a as a reflection tool, it ends up being pretty powerful. So, in the innovators' practice, my goal is to achieve a lot of these things that I was seeing from that uh, PhD research. How do we teach for a multidisciplinary, creative problem solving? How do we uh, teach for collaborative, creative problem solving? How do we teach students to increasingly manage uncertainty? How do we make that experience primarily about the students? And that's, a, that's about increasing their motivation as much as possible. Um, how do we work with and adapt to student needs and ideas as they develop? Uh, that's about you know, kind of structuring that motivation and ability um, tension throughout the classroom. And I can't fully anticipate that, which means a different structure of a class. And how do we work with student expectations of a very different type of class? Students tend to see it as this, a challenge to design something that personally excites them, that fits into and potentially improves people's lives in some way, and has real world measurable impact within the constraints of the class. And that's purposefully designed to keep it as motivating as possible for them while I try to um, get them increasingly versed in all of the different parts of the literature of this sort of layered decision-making process of innovative work. So at the midpoint and the end of the class, the students actually have to redesign the class with themselves in charge where they're responsible, not just for their own team, but for a class full of teams working on innovative projects. And all of the reading we're doing is on this literature. And by the end of the class, they have to be able to defend their redesign of the class decisions using uh, the literature. In the Design for Desirability class, uh, we have, instead of one or two big projects, like in the last class, there's a new project every week or two. Uh, these start with an area of psychology. so that relates to product design. So something like like belonging. So we might look at a product that um, does a very good job at creating a sense of belonging. And then we we try to understand as much as possible that case and how they've achieved that. Another week we might be looking at interpersonal status display. Uh, and then we apply what we've learned from that to a different product area. So one example from last year is we looked at, at anxiety reduction. We looked at products that have a calming effect, and we designed a headphone experience for anxiety reduction. And they worked on a team of four, and two people designed the headphones, and they have to create functional headphones.